Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another video lecture for Psych 370. Guys, this is the middle lecture in a series of three lectures that I have for you this week on the different theories of positive reinforcement that are described on pages 153 through 159 of your textbook. So in my previous video lecture, I talked about Clark Hull's drive reduction theory, but I finished up that video lecture by telling you about a few problems with drive reduction theory. So in this one, I'm going to be covering what's known as relative value theory, which was originally proposed by a psychologist named David Premack. And guys, Premack came up with a fairly radical revision to how we think about reinforcers by suggesting that we should actually view them as behaviors not stimuli. So for example, it's not the food itself that reinforces a behavior. It's the act of eating that the food makes possible because the food's not reinforcing until you eat it, right? It's not reinforcing until you perform that behavior. And so it's that behavior, eating, that's actually the reinforcer, according to Premack. By the same logic, water is reinforcing because it allows drinking to occur. My son's Nintendo is a reinforcer because it enables gaming to occur and so on. So activities are reinforcers. Behaviors are reinforcers, not stimuli. That was Premax insight. And of course, some behaviors are more valuable to an individual than others are, which is why Premax theory is known as relative value theory. So given a choice between two different behaviors, animals are likely to prefer one, right? Relatively speaking, one of those behaviors is gonna be of greater value to the animal than the other one is. And so guys, the basic idea here is that behaviors differ in terms of their relative value to an individual and more valuable behaviors will reinforce less valuable behaviors. In other words, more probable behaviors, behaviors that the animal just naturally performs more frequently, those behaviors can reinforce less probable behaviors. So those more probable behaviors can reinforce these other behaviors that the animal doesn't perform as frequently. That's the core idea here with Premax theory, and it's come to be known as the Premax principle. We call this the Premax principle. So reinforcers are behaviors, not stimuli and a more probable behavior can reinforce a less probable behavior. That's the Premack principle in a nutshell. So if you wanna find out whether one behavior will reinforce another behavior, then what you should do first, according to Premack, is just observe the animal for a while. So see what it chooses to do, see how it chooses to spend its time when it can spend that time freely. Then make a rank ordered list that goes from the most frequent behavior to the least frequent behavior. And once you've done that, then you can refer to that list to know what you can and can't use to reinforce a certain behavior. So for example, let's say that we have a rat in a Skinner box and we give this rat unlimited access to food, to water, to an exercise wheel, and to a window that it can gaze out of. So there are these four behaviors that we're interested in, eating, drinking, running, and gazing. And we wanna know the relative values of those behaviors. And so we observe the rat for a while with no restrictions on its behavior. We let it do whatever it wants to do. So we just observe it for a period of time. We record what it does, and then we rank order those behaviors in terms of their frequency. And let's say that the most frequent activity for this rat was eating. So relative to the other behaviors, this rat spent the highest percentage of its time engaged in the eating behavior. So that's number one on our list. The next most probable behavior we'll say was drinking, followed by gazing out the window, followed by running in the exercise wheel. Well, according to the Premack principle then, we can use eating to reinforce any of the other behaviors because eating was the most valuable behavior for this rat, right? It's the one that had the highest value. So relative to the value of the other behaviors, eating had more value for this rat. So for example, if you made the ability to eat contingent on gazing outside, then you could increase the frequency with which the rat gazes out the window. So eating could reinforce gazing because again, eating is more valuable to the rat than gazing, it's the more probable behavior. 
Or if you only let the animal eat after it first drank some water, then you'd increase the frequency of the drinking behavior. Eating would also be able to reinforce drinking because for this rat, it is a relatively more valuable behavior. The rat prefers eating over drinking. Eating is a higher probability behavior than drinking is. And so that's why eating reinforces drinking. But you couldn't use running in the exercise wheel to reinforce drinking because running is a less probable behavior for this rat than drinking is. So the rat prefers drinking over running. So drinking could reinforce running, but running can't reinforce drinking. In fact, if anything, if you required this rat to run after it drank, if you set up that contingency, then that would punish the drinking behavior. We'd see a decrease in the frequency of drinking because it produced this less valuable behavior, running, as a consequence. But anyway, that's the idea. More probable behaviors can reinforce less probable behaviors. And so as long as you know how frequently a certain animal prefers to perform certain behaviors, then you can strengthen the less frequent ones with the more frequent ones. So if an animal has to perform a less preferred behavior first before it can perform a more preferred behavior, then that first behavior is going to get stronger. It's going to increase in frequency. And that seems pretty obvious, right? But really, that's what the premet principle is all about. And so some people call it grandma's rule. There's another name for it, grandma's rule, which is basically first work, then play, right? That's what grandma makes you do. You do your work first. So you do that less preferred, less probable activity first, and then you get to play. Then you get access to the more preferred activity. So that's the premet principle. Now, to test this idea, that more probable behaviors will reinforce less probable ones, Premack conducted several experiments, some with children, some with rats. And so I'm going to finish up this video lecture by talking about that research a little bit and then showing you guys a video about the Premack principle. I'll tell you about the experiment with kids first. These were first grade children in this study. And what Premack did first was he allowed them to play with a pinball machine or operate a candy machine as much as they wanted. So that was the baseline phase, essentially. He just needed to determine for each kid what their higher probability behavior was, playing pinball or eating candy. And some of the kids spent the majority of their time playing with the pinball machine, and others were more interested in the candy machine. So that was the first phase. Premac does these initial observations of the kids, and he records how they divvy up their time when they're sort of left to their own devices. Then in the second phase of the experiment, the pinball players and the candy eaters were each subdivided into two groups. One group had to play with the pinball machine first before they were allowed to operate the candy machine. And the other group had to operate the candy machine first before they could play with the pinball machine. And the results were for the kids who had preferred the pinball machine in the first phase, they ate more candy in the second phase if that's what they had to do to get access to the pinball machine. So for those kids, playing pinball reinforced the candy eating behavior. And for the kids who had preferred the candy machine in the first phase, those kids played more pinball in the second phase if that's what they had to do to get access to the candy machine. So for those kids, eating candy reinforced the pinball playing behavior. So again, different kids had different preferences right? For some, playing pinball was the more probable behavior. For others, eating candy was the more probable behavior. But whatever that preferred behavior was for a particular kid, it was able to reinforce, it was able to strengthen and make more frequent whatever that kid's less preferred behavior was. And of course, that's exactly what the PREMAC principle predicts, right? So if you've got to perform a less probable behavior before you can perform a more probable one, then we're going to see an increase in. We're going to see the reinforcement of that less probable behavior. So Premack originally reported those results with human children. But then a few years later, he also conducted a couple more experiments with rats, where first in the baseline phase, those rats were free to either drink water or run in an exercise wheel. So those are the two behaviors that he's looking at here in this 1962 study, drinking and running. Now, in the first experiment, 
those rats were water deprived. And so they chose to spend most of their time drinking and not much time running. So for these water deprived rats, drinking was the more probable behavior and running was the less probable behavior. And later, Premack found that drinking could reinforce running. So if the rats had to run before they could drink, then they would increase how much running they did. Drinking could reinforce running, but running couldn't reinforce drinking for these rats. So if the rats had to drink before they could run, Premix set up that contingency for them, then their drinking behavior didn't really change. It didn't increase. It didn't get reinforced by the opportunity to run in the exercise wheel because it was already their preferred behavior. So they just went right on drinking just as they had during the baseline phase. However, in a second experiment, Premac used rats that weren't water deprived. And so those rats chose to spend most of their time during the baseline phase running instead of drinking. So their preferred activity was running. For them, running was the more probable behavior. And of course, what Premack found in that experiment was that now drinking did not reinforce running. So if the rats had to run before they could drink, then that didn't increase how much running they did. But running could reinforce drinking. So for these non-thirsty, non-water deprived rats, running was the more valuable behavior. And so if the rats had to drink before they could run, then they would do more drinking so that they could do more running. So guys, there's certainly some empirical support for the PREMAC principle, and it's also been applied in some pretty interesting ways. So before I finish up this lecture, I have a video that I want to include here, which will review the basic idea of the PREMAC principle, and it'll also discuss how the PREMAC principle might be applied in a classroom setting. David PREMAC was a psychologist in the 1950s and 60s who became interested in studying the internal motivation for particular behaviors. Premack argued that when you consider all of the possible behaviors you might do, such as when you are presented with free time, you could rank order your preference for each behavior, depending on your personality and needs at the time. For example, some people might choose to read a book during their free time, while other people would choose to watch a movie instead. While most people don't consciously rank order which behaviors they generally prefer over others, Premack said, that if you observe another person's life, the behaviors that occur more often or the higher probability behaviors are probably the behaviors that person prefers. For example, let's say that a teacher is observing her student, Miguel, during recess over a period of one month. Miguel makes sure to spend at least five minutes of every recess playing on the slide. He only plays with the basketball for a few days in the month. Finally, Miguel only plays on the swings one time and then just for a few minutes before he moves on to something else. Premack would say that we can understand Miguel's intrinsic motivation for each activity by simply rank ordering each activity in terms of its probability. The most common activity was playing on the slide. So if we asked Miguel about his favorite thing to do at recess, he would probably say playing on the slide. Miguel's least favorite activity or the one with the least amount of intrinsic reinforcement is playing on the swings. We would know this because Miguel almost never plays on the swings. These ideas can be formulated into what is now called the PREMAC principle. The PREMAC principle states that preferred behaviors or behaviors with a higher level of intrinsic reinforcement can be used as rewards or reinforcements for less preferred behaviors. Let's go back to the example of Miguel. If Miguel's teacher notices that his favorite thing to do is play on the slide, she can use this information to her advantage. If the teacher sees that Miguel really doesn't like to do his math homework, she can try to reinforce him for doing the homework by giving him a reward of five extra minutes on the slide. This reward would probably give Miguel the extra motivation he needs. If Miguel's teacher had offered a reward that was less interesting to him, such as playing on the swings, that reward would not be very interesting to Miguel, so he might not do the math homework. In this way, the PREMAC principle can be used in a classroom setting. Teachers who know their students well can give specific rewards to specific students based on the activities they know those students will enjoy. A famous example of how the PREMAC principle could be applied in a classroom setting was a teacher who had trouble keeping her students quiet and on task. They kept getting up from their seats, 
talking, and laughing during the lessons. So the teacher told the students that if they could be very quiet and focused during the entire lesson, they could have a few minutes of running around and yelling before the next lesson began. This bargain worked very well. During the break, the students appeared to be very unruly with behaviors such as pushing the teacher around in the wheeled desk chair. However, the few minutes of unruly behavior allowed the students to have a reward for spending the rest of the time doing their work. In summary, the PREMAC principle states that we can use more enjoyable or more intrinsically motivated behaviors as rewards for less intrinsically motivated behaviors. Techniques based on the PREMAC principle are very useful for teachers because they can allow teachers to know what rewards will work on certain students and what rewards will not. Okay, so the PREMAC principle clearly has some important practical applications. And again, PREMAC also introduced a pretty significant change in how we think about reinforcers by viewing them as behaviors rather than stimuli. Still, having said that, the PREMAC principle is not without its problems. And probably the most fundamental problem with it is that sometimes a less probable behavior can actually reinforce a more probable one. In other words, it's possible to violate the PREMAC principle. And so guys, because of that, other theorists have revised the PREMAC principle to point out that any behavior can act as a reinforcer if the animal has been deprived of performing that behavior as much as it normally would. And so that idea is called response deprivation theory, although it's also known as bliss point theory because it suggests that each animal has an optimal way that it would like to spend its time. And so it's gonna to wanna to get as close to that bliss point. It's gonna to wanna to get as close to that optimal distribution of behaviors as it possibly can. Okay, well guys, I won't go into any more detail than that for now about response deprivation theory, but it is the topic of my next video lecture. So I'd encourage you to check that out when you get a chance. And of course, if you have any questions about any of these theories, then please let me know. That's gonna do it for this video lecture though, so take care.